Good morning and uh, thank you for inviting me over for this conference. Um, what I'll be speaking about is more uh, in terms of a musician's perspective of how we perceive these different terms that we use, swara, gamaka, phraseology or motive as it's given, and raga identity. Now, even in the musician's community and the musicologist's community, there have been certain ways we have described these terms, especially swara, gamaka, for at least for the last century, which I think needs to be revisited also on how we use these terms and what is their role exactly in terms of the music that we actually produce. In terms of Raga Sangeeta that we sing or the music or the ragas that we sing, what is exactly the role? Either do we need to reinterpret some of these terms or even do away with it? That's of course completely subjective. So, but it's I think interesting to look at these terms. So we'll just, I'll try and I'm not much of a PowerPoint person, so there'll be just a few slides that he'll bring about. I'll do most of the talking and try and also do some singing with uh, Vignesh's help also. Um, now the word swara in general is, can be called a musical note within the Indian musical context. And we define it as having a definite pitch position. And out of which we say, of course we accept that the tonic, like we discussed yesterday, the sa is the is fixed tonic, and the pa is also a fixed position that we that we fix according to the sajja or the sa. Ri, ga, ma, dhani are also fixed positions, but they get their identity not just by being ri, ga, ma, dhani, but because they also have fixed variable positions that we call swarasthanas or swara positions. Sthanas where the swaras are. Now. And what I'm saying here is how we generally perceive the word swarasthana, the word, way we perceive the word swara. So swaras riga madani have variability according to the positions they can they can have. Now, if you just take the next chart here, I would like actually Vignesh, if possible, to just sing them. Can you? Give okay, a mic. Oh, sorry, sir. Slow here. Yeah, it started Sa and Sudra Shivam. Pa Putru. Now you have, you have Rishaba, Ri, you have three, very, three, basically, we'll first sing two types of Ri. Sadharna Gandhara. Antara Gandhara, or what we've said is Gatri. Shuddha Madhima. When he sings all the rest of the notes to show you the Devata, ignore the rest, please. So right now, all you need to listen to is the Da, Shuddha Devata, Da 1. Da, Da, Chatushri Devata, Ni, Kaisik Nishada, Ni, Kakil Nishada, and the other octave, Sa, if you are going to see. Now, this is... Basically, the 12, 12 sthanas, but at least for more than about 200 years plus, we have used 12 sthanas or 12 positions, but 16 names. So there are shared sthana positions for four. Now, the shared positions are, that's why he didn't sing them in the beginning. Can you go back to the previous slide? If you look at Sari, can also manifest as Sa ga sa ri ri ga ashuddha gandhara. 
the sadharana gandhara or ga 2 can also manifest as a third manifestation of rishaba sari sagari the chatushri devata pada can also be pani the kaishik nishada pada ni can also be pada now this is term that again we have used for many many years in different contexts meaning different things called vivadi in today's context what we generally refer to as vivadi is when the, there are these shared positions and these swaras mentioned on the right here shuddha gandhara shashi trishaba shuddha nishada and shashi devata replace these positions and are called those notes these are the four swaras in general in today's parlance that we call vivadi swara it's very important to understand this because there are different explanations to the idea of vivadi starting from bharata to now okay and in today's context many of them really don't play a role it is this explanation that is actually of any relevance to today's carnatic music when you have shared shared positions and these swaras replace what if you want can call the natural positions for those points it's called a vivadi but there are some interesting things that happen when these swaras appear now if you take a melodic source i'm still not using the word raga but if you want ga one to occur that source has to have re one which is let me sing and show you this ga one is basically sa ri ga you cannot have a melodic source as sa ga ma you will never have a case of that happening you will have if you had that it will be interpreted as re sa ri ma so only possibility of having ga one or the replace vivadi swara is if there is an evidence in that in that source of a re one again i am right now only talking about positions and just relating to positions of swara similarly sari you cannot have a raga that is sari ma pa in fact there's a historical case i'll tell you that there's a raga called udhir vichandrika which in the past actually was referred to as sari ma pa ni then it was corrected because you cannot have the vivadi swara or the replace note sari without ga being present so therefore it was replaced as sa ga sa ga ma pa ni pa ma ga sa sa ga so the it was taken back so this whole vivadi swaras or the swaras that replace natural positions that are there occur only when there is one variant of the of the natural positions close by to it so similarly you can't have shuddha nishada without the raga having shuddha devata if you don't have shuddha devata the shuddha nishada will automatically become i mean yeah will become the chatushuddha devata position these four interesting cases you find you don't find any raga that actually breaks this or even any scale not even let's not even go to a raga now the other i'm i'm again i said i'm coming from a traditional idea of a swara and swarasthana and then we'll see whether we can actually break them down the idea of a movement of a single swara now as it's it was discussed yesterday and we've been discussing that no swara in today's context in carnatic music is a single position it's a range it's a range around which there's multiple movements and multiple interpretations and this is that range collectively is what happen, gives you variability to that swara also so in any raga the identity of the swara is very very well married to this movement that is happening with the swara now two things here is how is this range first of all defined i mean if you say there's a range of movement there is a huge element of cognition there which has to be put in the range is definitely influenced by the cognition of how that range reflects that melodic identity that we are dealing with that's how the range is defined and of course what is what are the other phrases and other swaras around also 
definitely influence it. But cognition is definitely something that is very important. So is there any specific rule that can be placed to the way this range is defined? You can't look at specific rules. There are some general behavioral patterns that you can look at which I will also refer to and demonstrate. So if you, I mean therefore if you take Kalyani as a raga, then you will sing Kalyani as this. You don't have a mic there? Okay. Hmm. Basically, what he sang to you is the is the swaras in Kalyani. I don't understand this, I hope you do, but I just know how it sounds, but that's 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 all, that's about what I know. Now so the permissible amount of movement that can happen to a swara is partly cognition and partly also the behavior of that swara or that range of movement in connection to what are the other melodic identities around it. So you could have the same swara with different ranges depending on the context of where they are and what melodic source they are representing. So one swara does not have an fixed range. The swara has a range depending on what is the context in which it appears. Therefore, this has to be, this is extremely variable. So, this is what we of course call gamaka. So, to me, gamaka is like a variability of movement within the context of certain phraseology. But what is also very important for it is a cognitive understanding of the swarasthana also happens in that range. When I say swarasthana, I am talking about a specific semitonal position that we have determined as having in an octave. You have 12 with 16 names. In a gamaka, when a gamaka is there, a swara is expressed with gamaka, through gamaka or along with gamaka. Though you are not referring to any specific position, a cognition and under, cognitive understanding of that position is already there for the person. So if I sing a certain swara of a certain raga with all its movement, yet in my cognition it is that swara or that swarasthana. So this cognitive, it should constantly cognitively give me the reference as saying I am singing that. That is how I get an understanding that this is where I am, otherwise it is lost. Then there was, there was a discussion yesterday about, I think sometime about um, Appaswaram also, I think this morning also. There is another interesting thing that happens. When this range is superseded, a sound of Appaswaram also appears. For example, if you are going to sing, okay? I have not done anything wrong actually. But this is upper surum because the, the range of that what we understand as whatever I sang has been superseded. I have actually gone above the sajja and come back down. But in that context, so when the range of this, the movement is also moved either this way or that way, there is a tendency to hear an upper surum also. Depending of course on where, how, when it is sung. I just wanted to say this because we had this conversation in the morning. So the whole idea of Gamaka has been referred to for uh, for many, 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 many years. Um, the Sangeeta Ratnakara talks about 15 Gamakas. The Raga Vibhoda talks about Gamakas. Everybody talks about Gamakas. Now, can we really relate Gamakas as we understand it today to them? I don't think so. There is a great deal of difference between what we understand now as Gamakas and what they probably interpreted. Sometimes you even find, for example, a treatise called the Mahabhar Mahabharata Chudamani, where what he, the famous term used, Dashavida Gamaka, is used by every person who talks about Gamakas. But the oddity there is that many of the Gamakas mentioned in this treatise, which is not very old, looks like phrases, looks like phrase formations, but not single swara operations as we understand it today. So directly we cannot definitely reference any of those. One treatise that of course which is closer to our times that does talk about Gamakas is the Sangeeta Sampradaya Pradeshini and this is the huge list he has given. Now out of which pretty much the last, I mean the Tribhinna, Mudrita, Namita he himself does not use at all. 
Now, Mishrita is, is only a combination of the rest. So, what he actually uses is the first, first three say, what you see there, Kampita, Spurita, Pratyahata, Nukku, Ahata, Vali, Ullasita, not Hampita, but Kurla. This is what he uses and he actually created a notational system that he could describe every movement. Now, while some of these movements are close to what we sing today, some are not. Definitely some are not. There's, there's no doubt about it. Some musicologists and some musicians will definitely argue and I think sometimes val validly that you can actually use the symbols created by him to even interpret today's music. And there is some validity to that, to that discussion because as somebody who has experimented with it, it is possible for me to write today's line of music using the symbol he used, but of course interpreting it in today's context. So, now, the reason I'm going through all the types of gamakas is because that's so, so much talked about and we all talk about different types of gamakas. Now, of course, when I learn, I don't learn every gamaka by itself. My class does not go and say, okay, today I'll teach you Kampita Gamaka. Come, let's sing Kampita Gamaka. No teacher will teach you like that. You will just sing. In fact, you don't even know what gamaka you're singing. But that's how you learn. But it's interesting nevertheless to look at, try and dissect it for the sake of dissecting it to see why we should not dissect it. So, um, I'm just going to go through the gamakas as we see it today. Now, again, that's Greek and Latin, but I'll sing. Now, what we call gentai today is usually when there is a repetition of the same swara twice with a stress on the second swara. For example, pa pa da da. It was excuse my bad voice. Da da ni ni. Mama. So what actually is happening is there is a touch of the lower swara when you sing this, when you repeat the second pa 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 da da. There's a movement which is downward. This is called jantai. Jaru is basically a glide. It can be ascending glide or a descending glide. Ma ni ni ri viga. These glides are called jarus. Then you have Odukkal, this Odukkal is far more relevant to the instrument rather than the voice. If I sing Odukkal, it will sound exactly like Jaru. But on a Veena, the Odukkal is important, it is a movement on the same fret position. So if I was playing Pa, Da, Pa, then I am on the same fret position moving to Dha and coming back to Pa. A Jaru is across fret positions. Ma, Ni, Da. So this differentiation is more an instrumental differentiation. When I sing, you will not even find a difference between the two. Orikai. <coughs> Want to try that? Orikai is something that you get this right here. Ah, Orikai is right on top. You want to sing Orikai? Now this is something actually we use a lot. This is something you hear in Saveri, you hear in Kalyani, you hear in Todi, you hear it everywhere. This is this form of movement where you are actually going to an upper swara and then dropping yourself approximately, everything is approximately to the lower swara, is usually called an orikai. Kandip. Tanapaga is called a kandipu. So there is a hidden ma in between, which is not actually articulated by me. Then you have spuritam. Now these are all contemporary interpretations of these these terms. One important point in all this is, if I was going to actually articulate the swara while saying it, I'll only be saying one swara. I'm actually singing three swaras there. Or pa ga, pa ga. I'm saying ga, but I'm saying pa ma ga is what I'm singing. I will never say the ma. These swaras which are hidden within these movements are called also anuswaras. These swaras are attached to these swaras, but I don't articulate them. So, which means there is no emphasis on them while sung. So, when I sing, pa pa da da, it's not pa pa da da, it's pa pa da da. The emphasis is still in my mind. I'm singing only two pas. And actually, if I was telling a student, I'll say in Tamil, sa vadi. 
basically means hit it. This is what actually I'll tell the student. Now the student will know what to do. He'll hit it. He'll do pa pa is what he'll do. But this is what actually happens. Now, these are the different movements. I have not talked about one movement which I'll come to now, Kampita. The reason I've kept this for the last is the very identity of Carnatic music pretty much is enveloped in this in this variability of Kampita. This is one of the reasons why Carnatic music is also not so easy to listen to for people who are not very used to it. This Kampita is, is pretty much today, if I want to say what is Kampita, it's any kind of oscillation that comes, a meandering between swaras we call Kampita. In fact, everything we call Kampita. So actually, I would like to show you some examples of it rather than talk too much about it. So there are many ways you can interpret this oscillation or this, this movement. Why is it difficult to the ear? I'll just show you why it's difficult by singing it. Now, one classic Kampita which we sing, Madhima Padikam. Ma Ma as long as I keep saying ma, but I'm not singing, I'm not actually singing ma, I'm singing gapa, 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 ma, okay. Now, this is definitely something not, pe something people are not used to. In fact, I've heard people saying, you're saying ma, but you're not singing ma, what are you singing? This is very, very often you hear. So, it's very difficult, you sing gapa, but that's not the only way you can do it. You can do this too. Now, some Kampitas don't exactly start or end on a specific Swara position, not necessarily. You could have, for example, different interpretations of I sang all this is Kampita. It's nothing else. So in some cases you are not actually perfectly on either the, it's not dasa 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 da. It is not probably the Kaishik uh, Nishada which I am supposed to sing. So you are in between those ranges somewhere and depending on the voice of the musician and the interpretation of the musician, this will vary. But there is a cognitive recognition by all people who know the music that it is still the knee. So all these movements, now if I was going to take another kind of Kampita. Kalyani what we sing is is how we sing the Pratima Dima and the Kakling Nishala. So, in fact, this is where the Kampita starts on the Swarasthana higher than the position I am singing. All the rest I sang actually started slightly lower. Here it starts on a higher position. Now you also have cases where, now we talked about Sa and Pa being fixed. Actually in music they are not also. They are also movable. If I sang, the swaram padani sa pa. So it's not sa pa. I, that is sa for me. Sa ma ni da pa. So in the melodic context, the sa and pa also play around. Sometimes what happens in like in padani sa in this raga, if I was going to sing the phrase. The sa almost swallows half of the finishing of the knee and starts off. Padani sa, padani sa. So there is no actual completion of ni sa, ni sa. So this happens a lot. You will find this kind of movement in ascending phrases. In ascending phrases using Kampita, many times you will find this, the next swara swallowing into the previous itself. Now, there is two, with, I have to continue with Kampita, Kampita, a few more things because like I said, it's pretty much what defines what you hear in Carnatic music. All the rest are, keep coming and going, but this Gamaka, though we are trying to isolate it just for explanation's sake, it's all over the place. It's everywhere. It's this, this kind of movement is there everywhere, in every Raga. Now, but there's an interesting, couple of interesting things is, 
if you go back to the word of Sadarna Gandhara and the position being and Kaishi Kishnada almost in every traditional raga that has Sadarna Gandhara and Kaishi Kishnada it will be oscillated with Kampita Gamaka this movement will be there everywhere for example, if I was going to sing Bhairavi, Gari Gama Padani. If I was going to sing uh, Hari Kamboji, Ni Dadaba Magama Padani. Padani, Padani. Sariga, Sariga. So the Sadarna Gandhara and Kaishiki Nishada, almost most of the times, like always, there are always exceptions, but most of the times are extremely heavily, you know, oscillated notes. In fact, that's very important. Similarly, the Pratimadhima and the Kakali Nishada, Ma, Ni, these two, are never sung in today's context anywhere close to. They're always sung as almost Pa and Sa. Ma, Ni. So many times we'll be actually saying, the sneeze almost at sa. So Kakil Nishada and Pratimadhima are always oscillated with pa or sa, depending on which one. And they are very, very close to Panchama and Sajja. The ragas where they will not be are usually ragas where there is no Panchama. If there is no pa in that raga, then the ma will be far more, will be lower than how it is sung otherwise. Now, here I have to use um, one more thing. In Kampita Gamaka, generally on an ascent, ga, ma, ri, ga, ya, 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 ma, the movement of ga will be far larger. On a descent, ma, ga, ri, will be slightly less. These are all like just basically thumbnail rules. Nothing is absolute, but you will generally find this happening. Another thing, most ragas, one, if there is one swara that is in a phrase which is very highly full of gamaka, the next swara generally has less or no gamaka. Generally. Ma, if I would just go to take, Sari ga ma pada ni sa or Pamada Pamagari Sa Sari Sari Ga Sari Ga Sari Ga Sari Ga So this interrelationship you find that when you have one Sura which is very heavily full of Gamaka the next Sura is generally not endowed with as much Gamaka, it's generally less. So, in a way, that relationship is important. Now, there's a word that every Karnadi would say, this is a heavy raga, that is a light raga. The only thing that defines that to a large extent is Kampita. If there's a lot of Kampita in the raga, we'll call it a heavy raga. If there's far less Kampita, we'll call it a light raga. If you, you can just take a survey of whatever we call heavy ragas, all the heavy ragas will have heavy oscillations happening all of them and many of them are the older ragas so a lot of the ragas for example which we have, which we we imported even from hindustani music will not fall into this category for us it will fall into the lighter variety for us so whether it is behag or whether it is sindhu bhairavi it is never it is not perceived by us as heavy raga because we don't have this heavy kampita movement so this kampita movement is very very uh, intrinsic to what you hear this is why you hear what you hear. This is why you hear what is sometimes not even seem like in tune. It's because of this. I'm using the word heavy because that's the word as a musician I would use any time. Saying, or we'll, in Tamil we'll say, weight toda paade. We say sing it with a lot of weight. And we generally mean use a lot of this. Do not sing it light. Now, that's why I just want to stress on this movement because this is definitely something that, that, uh, that defines. For example, one more example, Raga Kannada. Pamatadana 
I can sing the same na ra okay na ri na ta ra na every carnatic musician say this is not kannada ta na that's kannada this the other guy is something that hindustani musicians will be able to immediately associate with far more than this ta ra na ri ra na ri but if i sang kannada i have to use this extra to make it sound like kannada as it is within the understanding that we have of that raga or the identity we have given that raga now I'll finish this with just one example of a beautiful example of a composition where the swara ga is given so many manifestations this has been quoted by numerous musicians how much time do i have more 10 minutes okay really wow okay i'll have to sing this because it's been quoted many times it's a in the raga thodi it's a part of a composition mm. just hear the gas that's all you need to hear gari sa gari ga 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 ma ma gari sa gari ri gari ni da gari ri ga every ga was different ga sa gari ga 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 ma ga pa ga da ga ni da ma ga ma da ma ga ma ni da ga ma pa da ni ga ga ma ga ma pa da ni ga ga ma pa da ni sa ri ga ga ma ga ri sa ni ga ga ri ni da ma ga ri ga ga ma ma da da this is according to t vishwa who did a who according to him there's something like i think he said 12 or 13 or even more number of guys but every guy is different depending on ga 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 so and many of them are manifestations of the same kampita there are exceptions but many of them are so i just thought this is a good example to show you this understanding of what it sounds like now therefore I that's what I think at this point we have to look at what we generally refer to as a swara and a swarasthana whether it has any relevance at all in this context a swarasthana is referred to historically and even as a as a position as a semitonal position it actually has no reference today to us if you ask any student to sing nishada or kalyani or kaakal nishada he will sing ni he will sing ni nobody will sing ni that way so the word swara first has to mean much more the swara is more like a melodic atom that includes in itself the identity that it has that it forms including whatever you call the gamaka otherwise it has no sense the swarasthana in my opinion is irrelevant sadharana gandhara's position has no value in my music because sadharana gandhara to me is a sound a range of sounds within a melodic idea it is not a position therefore whether we need to use these terms or to identify these positions at all to understand the music is something that needs to be asked i think very very seriously whether you need really need to know where sadharana gandhara is where is g3 where is n1 where is da2 what difference does it make if you are trying to listen to the music or trying to understand the music or even recreate the music what you have to see is what is that sound what is the sound in in capsa can capsulating by itself how can you recreate that sound how can you actually understand that sound i i believe that that is far more important question than searching for these markers because the moment you are pointing a position and saying everything is around that position there is a problem because that position is of no relevance when it is being sung it's the whole thing together that is what i look at so that's a question i want that's why i think the word swara is first of all means much more it means much more than a point position and the word swarasthana in today's music actually as being semitonal position is of no value to us it is a theoretical value that is probably has its own reference but musically it really does not it doesn't matter if i'm singing tadarna gandhara as long as it is todi gandhara that's what i would look at it so 
I'm going to ru rush by. So obviously phrases are only an extension of, of this whole melodic item of swaras that we have. And a phrase is an interrelationship between swaras that, are, that's, that have these multiple range identities and swaras that have less identity or no, no range in the context of the raga. So the raga itself, in Carnatic music there's one problem, I just spent five minutes on this, spoken about it before, there's a problem in Carnatic music because of certain historical developments. Um, we say ragas are phrases, we say ragas are phrases, they are, their identity is spread across the swara, the phrase, continuity of phrase and the whole, whole uh, identity by itself. It's there in every element. But the problem happens in Carnatic music is when we started it about two, three centuries or plus go, four centuries maybe, started computing swaras based on swara positions. There were theoretical propositions made on how you could create scales based on permutations and combinations on number of swaras that could be there within an octave. Each theorist had his own interpretation. Based on those formulations, we started creating what we even now call ragas. But these ragas are not different from each other by this idea of phraseology or this idea of movement. They are different because they all have different notes. And I even showed this at the last seminar. I still would again because I think it's very interesting to see how in a phrase based raga you can't sing the same phrase in two ragas. In what we call scale based ragas today you can, you, you can actually go to a system and change one note in a full alapana of a, fra of a scalula raga, it will sound like the other raga. You don't need new phrases. You take a latangi alapana, just change the dha. Wherever there is dha, you change the dha. It will sound like something else. And you will not even feel that there is a different raga, there is there's something wrong with it. Because these ragas have not developed phraseology. They have purely developed out of positions of the swaras on which we have endowed them with the gamaka movements based on, of course, our cognitive understanding of how they should move. So this differentiation has created a problem. Now. Just I'll dwell on three things and I'll wrap up, just five minutes. How do you identify a raga or how do you even see similarities in the raga? We spoke about tonic yesterday, I think we had a discussion about tonic and it is very, very relevant to understand a raga. For example, that other day he actually sang something, just sing it. Magani Oh, so I want second say, no, 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 no tambura for it, sorry. Just sing it wherever you want. He's singing something else. To me, Nida Ma, Mada Nida Mada Nida Ma is what I heard. He sang Magasa Nirigari Nirigari Sa Garini Nirigari Nirigari Ni. It can also be Garini Magasa. Not a Kurunji, if I wanted to take it that way. So, unless I have the tonic, a piece of music can sound like anything. To me, it sounded like Sri Ranjani. The moment he sang it the other day, I said, This is Sri Ranjani. Because in my year, I had already placed the sa somewhere else. So, definitely, we discussed this yesterday. Without a tonic, you cannot discuss the raga, a raga as we understand it today. There has to be a fixed tonic to discuss raga. Raga's identity today is definitely based. Then, the raga's identity is also in there in the swara of, of, of many ragas. We talk, call them jiva swaras, we call them different names. Now, there are certain swaras. When I say swara, now I'm using the swara as an idea and not as a point. So let me be very clear. Now I'm using swara as an identity rather than a specific point. For example, in Shankara Bharanam, now there it's a, it's a very simple case of how the Gandhara. Now, for example, na, any person listening to Carnatic music who hears the first phrase, na, if there's an extended ga, na, ra, ra, na, it has to be Shankara Bharanam. It's almost, and all the compositions for us also give that. Swaraga. There are many cases. They keep highlighting those points. Interestingly, if I sang the same ga as the 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 chances it can be begada also are there. The the So these are all cognitive. Uh, markers that we have given ourselves and a lot of it is fed by the compositions that we have learnt. Now, similarly sometimes just if somebody is going to start an alapana, ta -da -na -na, everybody in the audience will go 
because everybody knows it's surati that's what's going to come nothing else is going to come so the mark the immediate marker because that knee is such a that whole form has been highlighted so much in compositional music and in the evolving of the music these markers are very very important to see where that raga is and why is this marker for example triggering that raga in my head so definitely cognition is there but there is the fact that there is something to that identity at that point that keeps referring me to surati without anything else now the same knee may appear in different context in different raga but if i was going to start a raga with the na important start a raga with the na it cannot be another raga it has to be surati so that is also important to see where is this marker coming in the process of music production now gamaka plays some very interesting tricks on us and i said why swarastanas of of uh, hardly any relevance sometimes you're seeing the same thing in three ragas but because you know it's that raga you hear it as something for example if i sang ta suppose i was singing ta na 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 ta da ra ra everybody who knows carnatic music will say it's todi i'll sing the same thing ta na this is madhimavati madhimavati has technically very very different sounding ri sa ni ba ni sa ri ga ri it's exactly the same thing i'm singing for both ragas there is no connection between these two ragas but because of the context of of it being in todi or madhimavati it is referred to a studio manual so it's the same as a, as a singer i know i'm singing as a, as a, any any instrumental will tell you they're playing the same thing absolutely the same thing but there's a difference now for another example for that is um very nice example shankara varnam and kalyani shankara varnam when we sing ma ta da na ta na this is also the kalyani ga ta ga ma ga ri sa ni ri ga ma da pa ma ga ma pa ma ga ri ga ma ga ri sa ni da pa ma da ni ri ga it's exactly the same the kalyani ga and the shankara varnam ma are just sung in this context exactly the same they are two different notes in fact this is what antaragandhara and that is shuddha madhima if you want to look at swarastanas or positions so this is very very important that we are actually seeing the same thing in different contexts but because of the context you're hearing something else so if you're just looking at positions it will make no sense at all because you will say this is the same as that yeah i know it's the same but it's not the same because it's it's identity in that creation is very very different there are many examples the context will change an example also for example if i could sing dhanyasi raga dhaniyashi ta ra composition va na ni ta va na ni 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 na ga ri ga ma ni ni this is riti gaula ni 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 sa ni pa ni sa ni pa ma ga ri ga sa ni pa sa sa ni da pa ni ri sa ni da pa ni 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 na na ra 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 ri 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 ti gola so many times we are singing the same kind of movement sometimes not for the same swara two different swaras sometimes for the same swara in two different contexts but what is important is in that context it is ri ti gola in that context it is dhanyashi it doesn't matter it's the same movement what matters is what is the context in which appears this is another example i've said before pa da sa is the same as pa ni sa it's the same sa ni pa ni sa pa da sa pa ni sa you will see the musician singing the same thing you will see the violinist playing exactly the same position pa da sa pa ni sa the da is supposed to be chatushil devata the ni is supposed to be kaishik nishad but we are singing both exactly the same depending on whether it is kamboji or madhimavati so what i'm driving at here is that as you saw the swara cannot be looked 
as something separate from Gamaka. The Swara cannot be separated from Gamaka. The Gamaka cannot be separated from phrase. A phrase is not a phrase in a Raga unless it has those identities of Gamakas, those relationships of Gamakas and those relationships of Swaras which is together in the context of the phrase. Tada na 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 is not Kamboji. Tada ra ra la la. So unless this marriage is not broken, you are not going to hear what you are supposed to hear. You are not able to create what you want to create. So whether these are components that you can look at individually, but they have to be looked at collectively as one unit to understand raga identity or even similarity or even what goes into it. Without this, you are not going to go there. There are so many other aspects. I am stopping here because I think I have run out of time. But all I'm trying to say here is we love to break things down. We love to break things down to components to understand them. But in the process of breaking them down, if you try to give them tags and identify them as some portion of the large, you're losing something in between. There's a, lo there's a loss in translation, as they say. It is not a portion of the large. It is a continuum of the whole large. And unless you have that view of swara, gamaka, phraseology and raga as being one continuum that is actually inseparable and does not have its form unless it is looked at upon as part of this continuum that creates identity, you are going to be always lost. Thank you very much.